my privilege now to introduce uh, Ms. Kiran Majumdar Shaw, our keynote speaker for today. Ms. Shaw is a pioneering biotech entrepreneur, a healthcare visionary, a global influencer, and a passionate philanthropist. She has scripted a hugely successful entrepreneurial story by building Biocon and has been awarded the EY World Entrepreneur of the Year Award 2020. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Kiran Majumdar Shaw. Hi everyone, um, this is Kiran Mazumda Shaw and I just want to say what a pleasure it is to be a part of uh, this very you know, interesting format, uh, the Ascent Forum. And I thought I'd uh, you know, really talk about entrepreneurship. Let me start by asking the cliched question which most people ask, are entrepreneurs born or made? And according to me, Every one of us has a latent potential to be an entrepreneur. And what differentiates a true entrepreneur from an aspiring one is the risk-taking ability. It is about those bold, brave risk-takers who finally go on to building their own businesses. And the others who don't take such risks and who rather prefer the comfort of secure jobs end up not being entrepreneurs. But I'm sure when there are challenging and compelling circumstances and when there is a kind of a survival instinct, it does create new entrepreneurs. In my own case, I call myself an accidental entrepreneur because I never dreamed to start a business of my own. It was a set of circumstances that basically led me into my entrepreneurial journey. It was a time when I felt extremely despondent because I couldn't get a job. I had returned from Australia as a highly qualified brewmaster and no one wanted to hire me in this brewing career. Not a single brewery in India felt that I was good enough or you know, important enough to hire. And most of them told me that it was because I was a woman. And so this gender bias is what got me to be very rebellious. And when I got this opportunity to start a business in biotechnology, I said, why not? I think this is something that I should prove to myself and to those who don't believe in me that I can actually run a business and a successful business at that because all of them believe that women can't manage businesses and women uh, are not capable of handling tough businesses. So let me show them that I can do it. So it was, it was with that rebellious streak that I started this business, a biotech business way back in 1978. And of course, I did start it in my proverbial garage with only 10,000 rupees in the bank. And I can tell you that the first five years of my entrepreneurial journey were indeed very tough, very challenging. And I always believe that entrepreneurs have to build credibility. So your first five years of an entrepreneurial journey are about building credibility. I remember in the late 70s, actually, entrepreneurs were those who kind of left big businesses where they had gained a lot of experience where many of them started their own businesses when they were gray haired. So they had a good understanding of, of what it takes to build a business. And they were trying to build their own businesses because they were risk taking and they felt that it was time for them to maybe create better opportunities, better economic opportunities for themselves. And that's how many of those entrepreneurs were born in those days. But I was in 1978, today's version of a startup entrepreneur, no business experience, very young and inexperienced at that, and with very little capital available to me because I obviously was not a uh, someone with savings. And I just had a great idea. So it was not an idea's age at that time. It was about proven technologies and proven business models that pe people were trying to build. 
And here I was trying to pioneer a new idea called biotechnology at an age of 25 with no business experience and no financial capital available to build that business. So you can imagine the kind of credibility risks I sort of basically inflicted on myself. Banks didn't want to lend to me because I was young, inexperienced, and I was a woman. People didn't want to work for me because they felt I couldn't give them job security. And most people thought I was doing something daft because nobody understood what biotech was all about. So you can imagine the huge credibility hurdles I had to overcome. But I did that with a spirit of challenge. And I think every entrepreneur has to be driven by a sense of purpose. And my sense of purpose was, hey, biotech is an exciting new frontier. And I want to have a research-led, science-led business where I can actually hire a number of scientists and prevent the brain drain that is happening in this country. So that was my kind of sense of purpose. And plus, I was trying to develop a biotech business based on replacing polluting chemical technologies with eco-friendly enzyme technologies. And I thought, wow, that's a cool idea. And why can't I make that happen? So these were some of the formative thoughts which gave me my sense of purpose and my sense of challenge. So the challenge I set myself was, come on, I'm going to hire good people. My first two employees, by the way, were retired tractor mechanics because they were the only ones who needed a job and they were willing to work for anyone, including a woman, a young woman at that. But a few years later, I got some really bright scientists to join me in my journey because they got excited. Banks didn't want to lend to me. I had to beg, plead, and I had to basically explain to them what biotech was all about. So what happened was I would go from bank to bank saying, this is my business. This is what I'm trying to do. Please try and understand that I need help. It was not the time of venture capital. There was no soft funding available. So it was hardcore, high interest lending. I managed to get one banker to believe in my story. And that's how I started building my business. And then once I started succeeding and once I started getting people to believe in what I was doing, of course, I was able to grow very fast. This is my early days. And then, of course, it was all the time about, you know, building, you know, constantly thinking about what else should I do. My whole story and my whole strategy has been about business differentiation, about global scale and about basically building strong credentials in terms of building global credibility. It was about quality, reliability, and to basically bring that understanding that India too can innovate. That was my whole story. And then from enzymes, I was able to move to biopharmaceuticals based on the same tenets. You know, today, again, my whole, you know, sort of sense of purpose is about making a global impact on healthcare. Why do I say that? Because I started looking at the global healthcare model, which I thought was broken. And I think COVID has reminded us how broken it is. There was no concept of social equity. It was all about profiteering at the cost of patients. And I just felt that was absolutely unethical. I said, we are in a humanitarian business. We are here to develop medicines which patients who need it anywhere in the world ought to access. And we should not differentiate between those who can afford and those who can't. And that was what was happening and it's still happening today because all the new cutting edge drugs are only available to the expensive you know, regions of the world where patients and governments can afford to pay for those medicines. And those medicines never make it to other parts of the world where there are as many, if not more patients, simply because they can't afford it. So I felt I had to do something about it. So I started with diabetes and insulin therapy, where I felt India was at the epicenter of diabetes, and yet we were importing all our insulins, and most patients who needed insulin couldn't afford it. They were using animal insulin instead of recombinant human insulin because that was cheaper and that's what they could afford. And yet we know that animal insulin is inferior to recombinant human in insulin. In fact, it's immunogenic to humans. So I felt, look, I've got to use biotech to make recombinant human insulin. And today I'm happy to say that we're amongst the top five insulin producers in the world. Our insulin and insulin products 
are marketed in over 75 countries and we are now a very recognized name in insulin therapy. So scale, quality, global reach, global impact. I think, and of course, innovation at the heart of it, because we are the only company in the world making insulin using what we call as a proprietary PIKIA yeast platform. No other company in the world makes insulin using this platform. So that gives me my differentiation. I just wanted to give you that as an example. And then I went on to developing antibodies. I started looking at novel products. We are trying to develop an oral insulin in a tablet. We are trying to develop bispecific antibodies for cancer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I just wanted to give you an idea as to what my entrepreneurial journey has been. The fact that I've come this far and I look like a very successful entrepreneur who has never tripped up is not true. I've had many failures along the way. My first enzyme technology that we were trying to develop worked very well at pilot scale, but the moment we scaled it up to plant scale, let me tell you, we spent the first three months correcting a lot of scale up mistakes that we had made. So it wasn't like switching it on and everything worked well. In fact, nothing worked. And we had to really go back to see what were those big mistakes we had made in scale up. But it took us three months of very hard attempt. But the moment we corrected it, of course, it became a very successful technology for us. Similarly, there are a number of programs even today, which have worked or not worked. And so failures have taught us how to go back to the drawing board, take corrective actions, and then come back much stronger because we've always learned from our failures. And I always tell young entrepreneurs, success is about going from failure to failure without giving up. It is an endurance test. And remember, if you give up just because you hit the first failure, that is not a good idea. Because giving up too early will basically not allow you to recover and be resilient. Because I really believe failure is temporary, but giving up is permanent. So failure to me has always been temporary. Failure has always given me an opportunity to learn from my mistakes. And failure has actually, you know, been always converted into success after learning from them and correcting them. So that to me is another lesson of entrepreneurship, which I'd like to share with you. And thirdly, yes, a lot of people ask me, aren't there times when you want to give up? And my answer is, why should you give up? Because you've taken this big risk. You've embarked on a journey where you want to do things which really interest you, which excite you. And, you know, I don't think entrepreneurs give up that easily or give up at all. I will always be an entrepreneur till the end of my life. Because even today, I'm busy creating new companies. I've just started a new cell therapy company called Immunil, where we are trying to uh, deliver very low cost CAR T therapy, which can cure certain blood cancers. You know, many of these hematological leukemias and myelomas, which today are a, like death sentence to most uh, patients who get it, can actually be cured with CAR T therapies. But CAR T therapies are very expensive and they are only done in small, in a few parts of the world. And I said, why is India not doing anything? So then we said, okay, let's start it. And I started it with my good friend Siddharth Mukherjee, who's a very famous oncologist in the US. And he and I started this company in India, in Bangalore. We're about to start, of course, we've had a setback because of COVID, so we couldn't get the company up and running till now. But now that we are almost close to setting up the whole facility, we are confident that we are going to be able to treat the first patient by June next year. So that's the kind of uh, you know, strategy we have. And we're going to do it for one tenth of what it costs in any other part of the world. So that's the excitement. And yet, if you look at it, China is already ahead of us. And many other parts of the world are all ahead of us. But there are many parts of the world that don't have access to this kind of therapy. So we feel that we should be leading the way and coming out with newer and newer technology. So we are also focusing simultaneously on path breaking new CAR T technologies. So I think when you are an entrepreneur, you will always be an entrepreneur. And I for one believe that entrepreneurs must experiment all the time with new businesses, new ideas and new concepts. So 
that's the way I look at entrepreneurship. And I guess what I want to basically, you know, talk about as my leading messages for uh, entrepreneurs is it's the three P principle, purpose, perseverance, and passion. You must have all three of these. You must be driven by purpose because that's what keeps you grounded. That's what keeps you going. Perseverance, because I told you it is a game of endurance. Don't give up so easily. You are going to have a lot of obstacles, lots of failures, lots of mistakes. But it's that perseverance that keeps you going. And then, of course, you have to be passionate about that idea you're trying to take to the market or that idea you're trying to make into a big idea. And I have always believed that when you follow these kind of tenets, you will also make sure that as an entrepreneur, you will start with a small idea, but you can make it into a big idea. That's another message I have for entrepreneurs. You may start small, you may think small, you may have, you may think your idea is small to begin with, but try and make it into one big idea. And you know, some of the examples we have and which always inspire me are things like what Elon Musk has tried to do. I'm sure when he started with the concept of Tesla or his uh, space travel or any of the ideas that he has come up with, it's always been a small idea saying, I wish I could do this. I wonder what it would look like to do, to do, to build this kind of a, a, an idea, but look at how quickly it has become into a big idea. And that's what this whole entrepreneurial journey is about. You don't have to start with one big idea. You can start with a small, smart idea and really make it big. Those are some of the opportunities of today's entrepreneurs. And finally, coming to COVID, I think COVID has thrown up a huge number of opportunities for a number of new ideas. Who thought we would be in such a digital world? Who thought that there would be such a focus on healthcare? And how should we transform healthcare? How do we develop new products? How do we develop new vaccines, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, whoever thought that mRNA vaccines, which were being attempted for so many you know, years would suddenly become a stellar success. So, you know, we must understand that every idea has a time in which it suddenly comes of age. And I think COVID has made this happen. COVID has actually made us realize that telehealth also has a huge potential. So I'll end there because I'm sure there are lots of questions. Thank you for that uh, wonderful account of how you actually became an entrepreneur and your entrepreneurial, I would say, tenets and beliefs and uh, how you sort of see this journey as such. One of the questions that I was going to ask you, I was itching to ask you, and so you did touch upon it a little bit, and I think it's a big question on everyone's mind. So let me just ask it which is um, what's your point of view on when we're going to have a vaccine and how is that all going to pan out, not just in terms of the discovery, but also in terms of effective distribution for the large majority of the affected population around the world. So let me put this in context with, uh, of India, because obviously we know that uh, many vaccines are now nearing the end point. So for instance, right now there are three vaccines which are looking very good and very promising. Two of them are what we call as mRNA-based vaccines from Pfizer and from Moderna. But it is very unlikely that we will see it in India, at least for a long time yet. Because, you know, these vaccines will first be deployed in the US and the Western world, because that's where they have got the required infrastructure of ultra cold chain, which is required for these vaccines, which India right now does not have. But uh, we should look forward to the other vaccine, which is also nearing its regulatory completion, which is the AstraZeneca vaccine. And that vaccine, as you know, is also being developed in India by Serum Institute. And I think that will be the first vaccine of the block. And I expect and I hope that when the UK, the regulatory agency in the UK, MHRA, has basically indicated that they're willing to give emergency use approval by middle of December, Then I think based on that, I think our own regulator, the Drugs Controller General of India, hopefully 
will follow with an emergency use approval within a week or two. And if that happens, and it should happen, and it must happen, then I think in January, we are ready to actually deploy this vaccine. And as Serum Institute have said, they will be ready with 100 million doses by January. I think it's extremely vital that we start deploying in, uh, uh, vaccines ASAP in India to get us into a safer place. And I think what is good about the AstraZeneca vaccine is that it is a conventional vaccine. So even though we've abbreviated the regulatory development path, we at least know how these vaccines work. We still don't know how long they will protect us, but we know they work. And therefore, I think we should deploy them fast. We should be in a state of preparedness. And we should try and see how we can come up with modeling where, which gives us herd immunity in large dense clusters, because that's what is required. And I think urban centers will have to be the first centers where you deploy these vaccines, because that's where the economic engines are. And therefore, you want the economy to get back on track. And that's where you need to deploy your vaccines. And of course, you simultaneously deploy the vaccines in rural India. But I think we need to get our economy back on track. So I think we need to work out the you know, vaccination preparedness in many, many ways. Of course, it's much easier to do it in, in, in urban India. And I also think the private sector has a strong role to play. In fact, I've even suggested that, you know, a certain, say, 10% of the vaccines should be kept aside for the private sector to purchase. And that actually gives a respite and a relief to the government because the government can do the procurement for giving free vaccines, but I think a small percentage should be given to the private sector so that corporates can vaccinate their employees and make sure their workplaces are safe and so on and so forth. But what I also want to say is you're quickly going to get many more vaccines thereafter. You are going to get the Bharat Biotech vaccine hopefully by February. You are likely to get the j, &J vaccine and the Novavax vaccine also in February, March timeframe. So I think by March, we will have at least four or five vaccines, including the Zydus Cadilla vaccine. So then you have a number of vaccines to deploy. And it's very important that we have a, a digital tag to each vaccine because we really don't know the durability of response of each vaccine. So when you start getting data about the durability of response, you will have to go back to people who have used a vaccine with a very short durability of response and probably get them to be revaccinated after that time with another vaccine that has a higher, a longer durability of response and so on and so forth. That's the importance of a digital tag. Moreover, I can tell you that you will need to have a digital tag or a QR code or what, or even a simple um, document that says that an immunity pass which you have, which shows that you've been vaccinated because I can tell you that tomorrow international travel will demand an immunity pass before it lets you travel, whether you like it or not. So I think these are things which we must think about. Amazing. I'm My mind is blown by that answer because in the midst of all this misinformation and noise that all of us experience on a daily basis, I can't tell you how privileged I feel to get, get the answer straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak, from a stalwart of global healthcare. And I'm sure even though we took a little bit of a deviation from discussions around entrepreneurship and grit, I'm sure everyone out here has benefited tremendously from that answer. And But I also want to say that many of these things allow entrepreneurial opportunities. You know, how do we deploy vaccines? That itself, you know, tracking cold chains, creating these digital tags, creating these QR codes, all these opportunities, uh, you know, offers opportunities for uh, tech entrepreneurs. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, thank you for that. Moving on to a little bit more on the entrepreneurial side specifically, I, you know, one of the things in terms of grit and perseverance, and you talked about, you know, one of your tenets being, you know, why should you give up? And I can completely uh, wholeheartedly agree with that. And I'm sure every entrepreneur who is here at the Conclave will agree with me in saying that you're right. And Ms. Shaw is completely right. But then there's another side to it. Right. And um, something that I get aware of at times, um, sometimes I something and in the spirit persevering, you know, on your holistic dream and your holistic ambitions, 
you may have to call a spade a spade and realize that something is not working out and quit. So how do you balance the two? So I think you're right. I mean, I'm not saying that you just stick with an idea, even if it doesn't work. I'm just saying that you move on to something else. I'm just saying, don't, when you say don't give up, it doesn't mean you have to be so stuck with an idea that you just don't see that the idea didn't work and the idea is a bad idea. I'm saying that even if that was a bad idea, get into another group which gives you a better idea. It does do that. In fact, most entrepreneurs start with an idea which may not work, but that gives them an idea that there's something else which I should do. And they move on to the next idea. So I've also found that, like for instance, in many of our, our pursuits where we've tried to focus on one product, which we thought was a very cool idea, that product may not have worked, but that gave me an idea to try another product, which did. Yeah, absolutely. Got it. I no, say, when yeah. I say don't uh, give up in that sense, I don't mean that you should be so wedded to an idea that you should never uh, stray away from it. No, if the idea is a good idea, but for some reason it just doesn't work, you've got to call it quits at some time and move on to another idea is what I mean. Right. Another question, you know, you, you talked about and Biocon has been known as a player in global healthcare. And, you know, you talked about how you, many things were your, your entire field of vision and your frame of reference was not to be the best in India at something necessarily. It was about being the global best or aspiration or the ambition was always to be the best in the world at certain things. And that was always your ballpark, I would say, right? And there are many entrepreneurs in India who have that kind of ambition. I mean, personally, for me, my business is in the media and entertainment space, and everything that we do is focused on playing globally, and we play globally. What advice would you have for an entrepreneur who's starting out and sees the world as their market, whatever space it might be in? And also, how do you think, and you, you know, because you started where perhaps being an Indian company, um, was it was challenging right now i know that when you walk into a global forum because you're the people from india you're the guy from india you're the entrepreneur from india everybody wants to talk to you so that's come about now over the past 20 years but i suppose it may have been quite different when we went from being hyphenated as you know india china that only came in the 2000s so how have you seen that change and what advice would you have for anyone who has global aspirations and as an entrepreneur well, let me answer your question by saying that today, India is a very recognized player in IT. I would say in IT services, software services, I think India is very well recognized. And of course, in our field of pharmaceuticals and generics and, 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 and such kind of uh, low cost drugs, we are very well known. But we still have a huge credibility issue when it comes to novel products. Let's, let's face it. I mean, India is not known for innovative pharmaceuticals. So when you do come across or develop novel pharmaceuticals in India, we have a long way to go. So that's another challenge I'm working at, saying, how do you build that credibility? Today, we just blindly accept anything and everything that comes from other parts of the world, right? But ask a doctor in India to you know, prescribe a, a made in India drug. They have a big problem because we are brainwashed into thinking that we are not good enough. I think that is something which we must overcome. And I really think that this will only come about if we have a research temper in this country. We don't have a research temper in this country. We don't have an innovation research temper in this country. We are constantly mimicking and imitating whatever we see in other parts of the world. So I think we do need to get, become more self-confident of doing our own innovation-led research. And that's something I'm really focusing on within Biocon. And I realize there's a huge challenge because believe me, I've gone through credibility challenges in my early days and I know what credibility challenges are all about. So I feel that's one big credibility challenge we have to overcome. Uh, you know, where is this one Indian product in either the digital space or the pharma space that everyone is talking about. Nobody is talking about it as yet. I want to see if I can make one of those products happen. <laughs> Absolutely. No, that, that resonates with me because I know that, you know, while there is a lot of momentum and tailwind for India in general, but when it comes to actually stating, standing up and saying, you know, we're a quality player from India, 
depending on the industry you're in, it's a lot harder for a firm out of India to do it as opposed to, say, a German firm. You know, you just don't have that country. I mean, we are known as cheap and low cost. Yeah. But we are never known for innovation and really cutting edge products, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And on that note, I have a question from the audience. Uh, Ram Prasad Srinivasan asks, how did you balance the need to be affordable versus the need to be profitable? What was your philosophy and outlook on that when you approached it? I think, you know, there's a real misunderstanding of the word affordable. Everybody confuses affordability with being non-profit, which is ridiculous. I really believe that everyone should understand that there is, it is not mutually exclusive to be affordable and profitable. I, in fact, profitability is built into my affordability. If I can't be profitable, then I'm not affordable either. Please understand that. No business can afford not to generate profits. But in that profit, you have to make it affordable. I think the mobile phone industry has shown it. Any large scale economies of scale based industry has shown how profitable you can be. Today, you look at vaccines. It's a very good example. Serum Institute is going to give you the most affordable vaccine in the world. Do you mean to say they're not going to make profits? You mean to say they're going to be unprofitable? That's not true. They're going to be hugely profitable, but they have the cost and the, the cost base and the scale to make it affordable, which a lot of your Western economies can't do. That is the big success factor that we have in India. And that's what we have used in everything we do today. We are the most affordable insulin, but we are also a very profitable insulin company. So please don't confuse affordability with no profitability. You can be hugely profitable because unlike the conventional big pharma model, which is low volume, high value, we are looking at high volume, low value. That's the affordability. It's not about a billion dollars. It's about a billion patients. If you can cater to a billion patients, it will be multi-billion dollars and very profitable. So I think you need to look at affordability in that sense of the word. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Because as a layman, not really connected to the healthcare industry, except as a consumer, I, I know that the, I've heard an urban legend, and perhaps it's totally true about how uh, Mr. Poonawala went about the whole polio vaccine and the pricing on that and how he ended up capturing and disrupting the market completely. So, you know, I, I think that they can go hand in hand. I think uh, there is also, we all know that there is something quite wrong with uh, pricing in global pharma in general, which the US firms, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a topic for a, another day. No, but believe me, COVID is going to drive down prices. I think this social inequity that exists in the world markets, it's going to start declining. That's because, amazing. You know, I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on industries who've been profiteering, you know, and, and they are going to have to drop their prices. That's, that's great news for most of the world. Uh, and on that note, there's an Ashay Doshi who has sent in a question, which is that we have learned that big crises push us to innovate harder and faster. Can we expect the same push for cures of cancer in the coming years? What's your take on that? Absolutely. I think the kind of advances being made in the field of cancer are really impressive. I just mentioned CAR T cell therapy, right? And that is tremendous. But of course, it's very expensive. So we need to bring down that cost as well. Similarly, this whole area of uh, bispecific antibodies, immunotherapy, uh, antibody drug conjugates, all this is really changing the paradigm of cancer care and cancer cure. I think it's very exciting. And I think in the next 10 years, you'll see many, many cancers will be cured. That's that's really amazing news for everyone. And, you know, and, and on that note, uh, the other question I had regarding, you know, you said that all this profiteering, et cetera, is going to end. And that's because we all know, and talking about the US in particular, because it's such a, it's the major market that drives uh, everything in many ways. I mean, in terms of how innovation occurs, et cetera, especially in healthcare. What do you, how do you see, because the way I see it from the outside, at least is that, you know, healthcare is, U.S. healthcare especially is an industry ripe for disruption, which is how Amazon is seeing it with their entry into pharma delivery, etc. And I just think that it's a, you know, with the mix of the data that they have, the infrastructure that they have and the logistical capabilities that Amazon has, it is just a heady mix of, you know, it's a, it's a ticking time bomb waiting to happen to explode in a good way for creating consumer value. So how do you see Amazon's 
push into this space? Well, you know, today anyway, it's happening in the generic space. So it doesn't take an Amazon to disrupt it. I mean, today generics have anyway disrupted that, that space. I don't think Amazon is going to find it that easy to really deal with non-generic medicines because let's face it, pharmaceutical companies are not going to allow the Amazons of this world to disrupt the pricing model that they are used to. So I don't think that's going to be easy. What Amazon is doing today is to look at generic medicines and which have already been the time and uh, time tested by all the kind of uh, players in the field of uh, all the distributor companies who actually procure in bulk and sharply reduce the pricing. What is going to disrupt uh, you know, the US healthcare costs is really now this whole approach that the government is going to take in regulating drug pricing. And I think, you know, now with the Biden administration coming into play, into four, into the four, I think they are going to look at regulating drug pricing in a big way, where they are not going to allow, uh, you know, pharmaceutical companies to, to, to get away with uh, predatory pricing or price gouging. I think that's where the whole thing is going to be disrupted. And then, of course, yes, of course, it makes it more efficient to get the Amazons of this world to see whether they can do bulk procurement and, and, and pass on the benefits to, to customers. But it's not that easy because, you know, it's a very well entrenched system. I don't know who is going to let go. It sounds easy, but it's very complex. So let's see. Excellent. But it all bodes well for the future. I think uh, it's very, at least, I mean, you know, it seems from the outside that there's a lot that needs to be disrupted and ripe for disruption. And you've confirmed all of that. The other thing, two other amazingly positive things that have come out of this conversation. One is that profiteering will soon see an end because of the crisis that we're facing. And the uh, other great thing, which honestly, I'm thrilled to hear is that the dates and the timeline that you're putting for the virus being available in how you see it, Jan, March, etc. I'm amazed. I'm so happy because honestly, I had become a bit of a pessimist and I was thinking, you know what, okay, it'll go on mid-2020. No, I'm very confident that, you know, the we are going to see a huge economic rebound uh, from early next year. And I think from FY, F FY22, I think you're going to see a very strong uh, you know, revival of the economy and a bounce back of the economy. And once you're in a safe place where, you know, you feel that now the pandemic is behind us, you're going to see a huge sense of euphoric growth. And that's how I see the future. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Ms. Shaw. Uh, you know, I, I came into this conversation uh, thinking that I would end by talking about, uh, you know, what all you've shared with us about the past and uh, what we've learned from that. But honestly, you've made us, I think I've learned a lot more about the future from this conversation, which is really exciting. Um, thanks so much. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you with us here at the Ascent uh, Econclave 2020. And uh, thank you very much again for your time. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you.